Our next speaker will be John Morgan, and he will speak about Boncore Duality Portland. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and help Ron celebrate his birthday. I do wonder at the uh, organizers, uh, I question why the organizers invited me to talk, but reluctantly I agreed. I was afraid my talk would be in a completely disconnected component from all the other talks in this conference. So I was very pleased to see yesterday that Pranoff was talking about perverse sheaves because a variant of what he was talking about will also come up in my talk. So at least there's some overlap between what I'm going to talk about and the rest of this conference. This is a topology talk. Let me just remind you of what ordinary boardism is, smooth boardism. So we consider all compact manifolds, some set that includes all the isomorphism classes, like all the smooth submanifolds of our infinity. It gives us a set of manifolds for any space, topological space X. We consider continuous maps of the smooth manifolds of some dimension n into x, compact smooth manifolds. We use those to generate an abelian group, and then we put on a relation which says that if this manifold is in fact the boundary of one higher dimensional manifold and the map extends, then we set this element equal to zero. These are oriented manifolds. Well, when you do that, you get a nice group. In fact, it's a reasonable space. It's a finitely generated group. It's called the nth boardism group of X. And in fact, these all fit together as you vary in to make an extraordinary homology theory. And one even knows the classifying space for this homology theory. So that's the boardism theory. And these groups would be the boardism groups of X. Now, of course, one of the fundamental properties that these closed manifolds have is that their cohomology satisfies Poincaré duality. And if they happen to bound, then that self-dual cohomology sits as a boundary term in a, a self-dual long exact sequence, the left shed sequence of the cohomology of W and the relative cohomology of W on the boundary. And I want to build a bordism theory where the coefficients, that is the bordism of a point, are exactly the equivalence classes of chain complexes satisfying Poincaré duality, modulo those that would fit as the boundary term in a, a short exact sequence or an exact triangle of chain complexes satisfying Lefschetz duality. And I'll call those objects, Poincaré duality objects, and I'll call the Bordism theory that I will make built on those by mapping those objects and the things they bound into topological spaces, Poincaré duality, Bordism. Now, this is hot off the presses. I did this 40 years ago, 41 years ago when I first learned about intersection cohomology theory of Goreski McPherson, but I never wrote it up because the original approach used triangulations and clearly was not the right approach. Later, Balenson, uh, Bernstein, and Delinia gave a different approach and introduced what are called perverse sheaves, and that was clearly the right context in which to make these constructions and that is eventually how we'll do the construction, though when I originally thought about it, it was much more ad hoc, naive, down to earth, using triangulations and various kinds of subcomplexes of the singular complex. So that's what I want to do. So let me just remind you of duality for manifolds the way I want to think about it. So we have, my manifolds are all going to be oriented. So this is an oriented n-manifold. And so there's a 
locally finite or Borel Moore uh, cycle. cycle in the dimension of the manifold and cap product with this cycle induces let me see if I can get this right a quasi isomorphism between the cochain complex of V and the homomorphisms from the compactly supported cochains of V into the integers. Right. So it's this cap product with the fundamental cycle. Now, in fact, the right way to think about this is as the Borel Moore chains. On the, so there's an algebraic duality between the compactly supported cochains and the locally finite chains. The usual pairing extends to those. So this is a quasi-isomorphism. And it gives us, when we pass the homology, an isomorphism between the usual integral cohomology and the usual Borel-Moore homology of the manifold. Now, in the case when the manifold is compact, so now let's suppose that V is compact, then I don't have to worry about compactly supported cochains and Borel Moore homology. This becomes the usual Poincare duality isomorphism. I actually want to interpret that in terms of pairings. And to do that, I need the universal coefficient theorem. And maybe the nicest way to see that is by, in fact, using this derived hum uh, and using the injective resolution of Z, which is uh, the standard one, Q to Q mod Z. And then you get a, a double complex representing this thing. The spectral sequence of that double complex is, is very trivial, and it just becomes a collection of exact sequences and gives you, gives you the usual universal coefficient uh, statement, which I'll write this way. Everything is with integer coefficients, so I won't write that. Okay, so this is the usual universal coefficient here. Actually, I've switched homology and cohomology. Usually, you see it with the cohomology term here, but in this context, it doesn't make any difference. Okay. So this is the torsion subgroup of the homology. And this is, of course, the free abelian group, the free abelian quotient. Okay. So that tells us that through this isomorphism, the cohomology, which I can now put here, is related to hom of the cohomology to Z and some sort of hom of the torsion of the cohomology to Q mod Z. So you get two different pairings out of <coughs> this. You get the pairing Hn minus star V, insert H star V to the integers. That's the one that comes from projecting here. And using the torsion subgroups, you have the torsion of Hn minus star V tensor the torsion 
of H star plus one of V into Q mod Z. And these are the fact that the Poincaré duality is an isomorphism tells us that both of these are perfect pairings. In this case, that simply means the adjoint of this pairing is an isomorphism from this torsion group to the Andriagin dual torsion group here. In this case, to get a perfect pairing, for that to make sense, you have to divide out by the torsion here and here so that you have lattices and this pairing uh, is a pairing of dual lattices. It makes these lattices dual to each other. Now, of course, I'm a topologist, so I like to think of these pairings geometrically. The, this one's called the intersection pairing, and this one's called the linking pairing. So the intersection pairing has got the picture that we're probably all familiar with. If you have two cycles of complementary dimension, in an ambient manifold, you simply deform them slightly until they meet transversely. There'll be a finite number of points. At each point, you assign a sign that measures the various orientations. You add up over the points of intersection, and that's the intersection pairing. The linking pairing is made in a very similar way, but the dimensions are different. Now we have, if we of course, I'm describing things in terms of cycles instead of cochains, because I'm a topologist. Here you see the dimensions add up to one more than the dimension of the manifold. When you switch to homology, you have two cycles whose dimensions add up to one less than the dimension of the manifold. So generically, they won't meet. So they'll be disjoint, and they're torsion cycles. Therefore, some multiple of one of them, I'll say this one, will bound the chain B, boundary of B is N times the cycle little b. And then I can do an intersection just like I did between B, capital B and A. These now have complementary dimensions and then divide by N and get an element in T mod Z. And that turns out to be well-defined in Q mod Z, and it's the linking pairing of these classes, A and B, that's this pairing. So it follows from this description, though maybe it isn't completely clear in the earlier descriptions, that there's a, there's a symmetry to these pairings. Uh, if you switch two classes, you have the usual sign introduced, which is minus one to the product of the dimensions of the classes you're switching. So here the intersection pairing A dot B is minus 1 to the A B B dot A, and likewise the linking of A B is, if I do it in homology, minus 1 to the A plus 1, B plus 1, linking of B A. If I do it in cohomology, these just become the dimensions. So those are the intersection and linking pairings, and they're completely equivalent to this Poincaré duality isomorphism here in this universal coefficient. Okay. So let's think now about abstracting out the Poincaré duality. It's a, it's a question of how far in the abstraction or the, how much structure I should drop. So these chain complexes come with cup products and this evaluation is a cap product. You have cup product of the top dimension and evaluation. I could keep all of that, but in fact, I'm gonna drop all of that description and just require the quasi-isomorphism. So I'm gonna look at chain complexes, let's say for closed manifolds, so I don't have to worry about compactly supported things with the duality isomorphism from the chain complex shifted by N, so quasi-isomorphism, from the chain complex shifted by N to the dual <coughs> Complex or dual 
cochain complex to the dual chain complex. Okay. So if I have a chain complex like this, I can run exactly the same argument, suppose the homology is finally generated, that I just talked about, and I will produce the Poincaré duality isomorphism, and if I wanted these pairings. But it's no longer described by cup product, cap product, fundamental classes, it's a purely abstract quasi-isomorphism between chain complexes. So I could look at all of these chain complexes, let's call them Poincaré duality chain complexes in dimension N, cochain complexes of dimension N or degree N. <coughs> so I use those to generate an abelian group and the relation should be that it, uh, a cochain complex and a duality isomorphism phi is going to be set equivalent to zero if there is a left shits self-dual uh, triple with this guy as boundary. I don't think I will write out ex explicitly what this is. I'll leave that to your imagination. So I'm talking about these chain complexes that satisfy in this very weak sense Poincaré duality, enough to make the homology satisfy Poincaré duality, and I divide out by those that sit in a left shed sequence. So what are those groups? Let's call them the Poincaré duality groups degree or dimension N. <coughs> Well, they're in fact very simple. PDN is isomorphic to the integers. If it is congruent to zero mod four. The integers modulo two if n is congruent to one mod four. Zero if n is congruent to two or three mod four. And the invariants that detect <coughs> are the signature in zero mod four and what I'll call the Durham invariant in one mod four. So there are two homological invariants of homological pairings. Oh, I forgot to say, these dualities are supposed to have the symmetry required to make the pairings have the symmetry that manifolds have. Well, so if you have let me just say what the invariants are. If you have a Poincaré duality complex, uh, chain complex of dimension 4K, then the middle dimensional homology, H2K of C star, has a pairing on it. Which is uh, unimodular after you divide out by uh, torsion. That's the consequence of Poincaré duality and symmetric because the dimension in question are even, such pairings have a signature. Okay. If this chain complex has to sit, it happens to sit in a left shed self-dual uh, sequence, let's just look in the middle dimension here. So it's Let's, uh, let's see, we have H2K, let's call the chain complex for the manifold, or for the, the left shift's chain complex, W. The 
this is W uh, absolute, and this is W relative, the boundary, relative C. These groups are dual, these maps are dual, and therefore the standard argument shows you that the image of this group in here, mod torsion, is a Lagrangian subspace for the pairing. And if you have a symmetric pairing with a Lagrangian subspace, well, so that happens if and only if the signature is zero. So if you have one of these Poincaré duality objects in dimension 4K and it bounds in this sense, then its signature is automatically zero. Let me just tell you what the invariant is in 4K plus one. We're now talking about skew-symmetric linking pairing. So A is a finite abelian group. We have a pairing A tensor A into Q mod Z, which is skew, so this is the linking pairing. Linking of A, B is minus linking of B, A. Okay. You might think analogously to what happens for intersection pairings, skew-symmetric intersection pairings, there's always a Lagrangian subspace, so these ought to be trivial in some sense. But in fact, that's not true. i give you an example. Take A equals Z mod 2, and L of X, X is a half, generated by X. So this pairing, of course, is non-degenerate. Well, this is a non-degenerate skew-symmetric pairing. It certainly doesn't have a Lagrangian subspace. Its order isn't even a square. Well, this is the generator. Twice it, two copies of it, does have a Lagrangian subspace. This guy is equivalent. Sorry. Zero, zero. Is equivalent to zero, a half, a half. Well, this is the only issue with finding a Lagrangian subspace. So you simply count them in the group, in this finite group, the torsion part of the homology, you simply count the number of Z2 factors mod 2. That's the Raman pairing. And once again, an argument very similar to this one, working around the middle self-dual self group, the torsion uh, torsion self-dual group shows you that if you have a left shut sequence, in fact, you can find the Lagrangian subspace and therefore the Durham invariant has to be zero. So those are the invariants of these groups. It's clear that except in dimension one, these are all realized because they're all realized by manifolds. There's a manifold of dimension 4K of signature 1 for every K. And there's a manifold of dimension 5 with the Raman invariant 1, constructed by Smale in the 60s. And you can cross it with CP2, or copies of CP2, and find the manifold of the Raman invariant 1 in any dimension 4K plus 1, except 1, of course. But indeed, if you're willing to take abstract Poincaré duality spaces, you could hit a Durham invariant one in dimension one two, though it doesn't have a geometric representative. Now, the next thing I need to show, so I've constructed the invariants, shown they're well-defined, shown that the homomorphism is onto, so we have well-defined homomorphisms for these groups to the, by the invariants. The last thing I need to show is that if you have a, one of these chain complexes whose invariant is zero, then it's a, left, a boundary of a left shut chain complex. Let me do the argument in, well, I won't 
let me sketch the argument in the case of uh, the intersection pairing. So proof for n even. So I have a chain complex with a duality isomorphism. Okay. The first thing you can see is it's very easy to get rid of everything except the self-paired part of the cohomology. That's a completely general statement. If you have a uh, a homology group uh, down away from the middle, you can uh, remove it and the dual group up above the middle uh, quite easily by a left shift sequence. So you might as well assume, so we can assume that the homology is concentrated in the middle dimension. In this case, middle dimension n is even to k. So the only homology will be up to the equivalence relation will be hk and hk will be a free abelian group. And we have this intersection pairing which is either symmetric or skew symmetric. If it's skew symmetric it has a Lagrangian subspace if it's symmetric and its signature is zero, it has a Lagrangian subspace. So, because I'm interested in the kernel of this map, I might as well assume that there exists a Lagrangian subspace. Well, that tells me how to build a Lefschetz sequence. Let's call it L inside HK. Well, the Lagrangian sequence is simply uh, the Lefschetz sequence is simply HK of W absolute is L and then HK plus 1 relative W mod C is the dual to the lattice to L and we have L in HK to the dual lattice. This is I in F star. That's an exact sequence because this is a Lagrangian subspace. That's your left shift sequence. Very similar argument in the, um, in the linking pairing case uh, for the Durham invariant. If the Durham invariant is zero, there's a uh, Lagrangian subspace with the torsion pairing. The you work just the same. Dimension 4K plus 3 is a little more interesting. There, there are lots and lots of symmetric pairings on torsion groups. Most of them don't have Lagrangian subspaces, but every one of them is realized as the second cohomology of a three closed three manifold, and all three manifolds bound. So I'm free to vary my pairing by any pairing I want coming from a three manifold that bounds. And I can take the pairing plus it's negative, and that does have a Lagrangian subspace. So you have to do a little work in the four k Anyway, these are the groups. And I want to build a Bordism theory, geometric objects, so that the coefficients of a point, the closed objects modulo those that bound, are exactly these groups. Well, this is where intersection homology and perverse sheaves enter the picture. So let me give you a simple example of the kind of construction we're going to do or the kind of questions that we have to deal with. Suppose I have a compact manifold, and for simplicity I'll take it to be dimension 2L, it's a closed oriented manifold. I want to know, am I going to allow the cone on L? in my theory as a, as a Poincaré duality element with boundary or not. Well, if L is the boundary of anything, so particularly this cone on L, if I allow it, by what I've just argued, 
that implies that HK of L has a Lagrangian subspace for the intersection here. And indeed, if you have something that L bounds, it produces for you a Lagrangian subspace. So not only does L have to have a Lagrangian subspace, to allow this cone, somehow I have to have picked out the Lagrangian subspace. So, can allow the cone, if and only if, we pick out, distinguish a Lagrangian subspace of HK of L. Then conceivably, the cone on L and somehow something over it that records that subspace could be allowed in my theory. If I took this to be CP2 and coned it off, I better not allow that cone in my theory because the signature is supposed to, the signature is supposed to be an invariant. So CP2 can't bound in this theory. Okay, well this is where Goreski McPherson intersection cohomology comes in. They did not actually consider this case. They only thought about links, this is eventually going to be the link, odd dimensional links, because they were interested in complex algebraic varieties, so all the strata are even dimensional, so all the links are odd dimensional. And they were working with Q coefficients or field, co field characteristic zero coefficients, so they didn't have to worry about the middle dimension. I have both those issues to deal with. I have to allow all strata of all dimensions, all co-dimensions, even and odd. And I then have to worry about the middle dimension, which when the link is 2K dimensional will be K and, and be the free part, and when L is the odd dimensional, will be a torsion pairing that's self-linked. So, so let me, okay. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just work simplicially for a minute. Think of a triangulation where I have a triangulation on L and I simply cone off. What simplices am I gonna allow to form the intersection homology of this object. So we'll take all the chains, uh, simplicial chains on L, plus certain chains, cones on certain chains, on L. And I have to tell you which cones we're gonna allow, okay? So I'm following here very closely the original Goreski McPherson picture. So we'll allow cone on a chain zeta if the dimension of zeta is greater than the middle or if dimension of zeta is exactly the middle dimensional, zeta is closed and the homology class of zeta is in this Lagrangian subspace, call it S. Now let's pick a Lagrangian subspace, S. So this is a, some sort of partial transversality, half transversality. So I, I can cone off any, cha any chain on L if it's bigger than half dimensional of L. And in the middle, I'm allowed to cone off this chain if it's really a cycle and its homology class lies in S. <coughs> If you think about what that does, the homology of L to the homology of the cone on L, well, this is simply the homology, but what is this? Let's just see what this is. So what's the homology of the cone on L? Well, it's, it's, it's zero in degrees bigger than L, because I've allowed the cones on all the chains on L in those dimensions. It's 
hk of l mod s in the middle dimension, and it's zero below. Uh, did I get that right? I think I got it exactly backwards. Oh, no, no, I haven't. Yeah, I've got it exactly backwards. It's zero above, and it's the homology of L below, and it should be HK. All right, I'm sorry, I'm not getting this right. And if you think now about what the dual, what's the relative uh, homology of the cone mod the boundary, you'll get exactly the dual part of the homology. You'll get the homology above. In the middle, you'll get S. And these will exactly form the Lefschetz dual sequence. So the, uh, the intersection um, cohomology related to the perversity that Kapranov was talking about, we would take an odd dimensional link, we'd work with Q coefficients, so I don't have to worry about self-dual torsion, and then you simply do a dimension restriction. You kill off everything above the middle dimension, cones on, on chains above the middle dimensions, and cycles in the middle dimension. So there's no choice of a Lagrangian subspace there, uh, because we're working over Q and with links of Odd rank. So here I've had to make a choice, which I may not be able to make. Not all, as I've said, not all L2K have these Lagrangian subspaces, so not all cones will be allowed in the theory. And if a cone is allowed, you have to pick the Lagrangian subspace, you pick a different one, you get a different object in your theory. So that's the basic idea. And while so this is the simplest possible case. We're going to work, work with stratified spaces. So this will be the local transverse picture to a stratum. One can generalize this whole simplicial construction in that context. But as I said, it's much, much better to work, as far as I'm concerned, with the perverse sheaves, which will do this quite nicely. So let me point out, as I've already started to do, a couple of differences with the perverse sheaves I'm going to use from the classical perverse sheaves, though, as I've tried to indicate, everything I've done here is just a derivation or a perturbation off of the classical perverse sheaves. So we're going to be working with sheaves of abelian groups, uh, and their cohomology is going to be finitely generated abelian groups rather than cohomology over various fields. We're going to allow strata of any co-dimension except one. And it's not true in general that if you have a stratified space that you can put on one of these perverse sheaves, there'll be obstructions as you go along related to these uh, existence of Lagrangian subspaces or subsheaves. All right. Let me just say a word about stratified spaces before I give you the construction. So X is going to be a stratified space. And it comes equipped with a stratification that we're not going to vary. So this is simply, it's n-dimensional. So it's given by a sequence of closed subset. Uh, where xi minus xi minus 1 is a smooth manifold of dimension i.
notice that I don't allow any strata of co-dimension one. So my first strata, my first, the first lower stratum starts in co-dimension two, at least. Uh, the top stratum, xn minus xn minus one, is oriented, always. And the condition that I need for the sheaf theory on the stratification is a very weak one. If you look at a, so the manifolds which are xi minus xi minus one, the components of that are called the strata of dimension i. So here's a stratum of dimension i, here's a point in it, and I want to look at a neighborhood in the whole space. So a neighborhood of x in the entire space x is of the form uh, an open ball in Euclidean space, the I across the cone on a link of dimension n minus I minus one. So this is a ball in Euclidean space, so this is the intersection with the stratum, and then in the complementary direction, the orthogonal direction, we have the cone over a link, the link is compact, and it's self-stratified. And this neighborhood V of X, this isomorphism between V and this product is compatible with the stratification structure. So the various strata of L, the various strata of V of X meet V in the ball across the various strata of the cone on L. It's stratified and the isomorphism is stratum preserving. Okay. So it's a weak topological condition around the strata. Okay, so those are the stratified spaces. We're going to be working with what are called cohomologically construct, uh, constructible complexes of sheaves. So we're going to have complexes of sheaves that are cohomologically constructible. So that means their uh, local the cohomology sheaves are local systems on each stratum. with finitely generated stalks. So this is the world in which we're going to work. Stratified spaces and these cohomologically constructible complexes of sheaves. Over the integers, right? These are cohomology groups are finitely generated to be the integers. And we're going to work, I didn't say bounded, we're going to work with bounded complexes. Always. Okay. Now, at the heart of this construction is something called Verdier duality, which is beautiful and being as general as it is, in some sense completely trivial. But it's great. I love it. Now, suppose you have any reasonable space, Hausdorff, uh, locally compact, and uh, cohomologically finite dimensional. So, for example, any stratified space, any triangulated space, uh, lots of other spaces. Okay. Then, on any space like that, there is a complex. sheaves, bounded complex. That's what we needed the finite cohomological dimension for. Call it dx, the dualizing sheaf, the Verdier dualizing sheaf. Well, dualizing complex, I guess. 
complex. Okay. And it has the following properties. Well, first of all, if X happens to be stratified, then DX is going to be cohomologically constructible. So in our context, it's going to be of the kind of sheaves we're thinking about. And some of its properties if you look for any at any open set in X and you look at the sections of U in the dualizing complex, that's quasi-isomorphic. That chain complex is quasi-isomorphic to HOM of the compactly supported sections of U in the constant sheaf to Z. So if you take cohomology, this would be the hypercohomology of the set with coefficients in the dualizing sheaf. And this is what you would think of what is the Borel-Moore homology of the original, well, of the integer. So the cohomology of this complex over any open set U is simply the Borel-Moore homology of U in the opposite dimension. So for example, if X were a manifold of dimension N, the Borel-Moore homology is non-trivial in only one dimension, namely N, so the only non-trivial group over here is degree minus n, and it's isomorphic to z. So this cohomology is concentrated in one degree. And in that case, you can take it to be a sheaf instead of a complex of sheaves. It's concentrated in one degree, and it's isomorphic to z. So it's, in fact, a constant sheaf z in an appropriate dimension minus n. Okay, so in this case, x a manifold, dx is simply the constant sheaf uh, shifted down the dimension of the manifold. But in general, it won't be a sheaf. It will be a complex of sheaves, depending on the singularities of the space. So that's one property. The Verde duality property says that for, well, for any sheaf, any bounded complex of sheaves on X, we define the dual sheaf, the Verdier dual sheaf, is simply the sheaf hom of this complex into our dualizing complex. And then we have an isomorphism similar to this one, our hom of the compactly supported sections of C with C is quasi-isomorphic to the sections of the dual. Applying cohomology to this, we get on this side what you would call the Borel-Moore homology of U with coefficients in C being isomorphic to the cohomology of U with coefficients in the dual sheaf. Okay. So that's the general statement of duality. In case X is compact and we apply this with U equal all of X, we get that the ordinary homology with coefficients in C is isomorphic to the cohomology of X with coefficients in the dual sheaf. So that's a completely general construction. Okay. So, this is what we want to use. So, the idea here is, so this is a completely duality, a completely general duality that relates the cohomology with coefficients in the dual sheaf to the homology with coefficients in the sheaf. 
Planck ray duality is supposed to relate cohomology with coefficients in the sheaf to the homology with coefficients in the sheaf. So we're going to reformulate duality as an isomorphism between the sheaf and its Verdier dual. So we'll now say the sheaf over X satisfies duality in dimension N if we have an isom a quasi-isomorphism from the complex shifted by degree N into the dual complex. This is what we'll mean when we say C satisfies duality of dimension N. And then this statement becomes the usual Planck ray duality story. Well, this statement becomes the usual local Planck ray duality, and for compact closed objects, this becomes ordinary Planck ray duality. And for closed objects, Uh, the cohomology of X with coefficients of C satisfies point ray duality of dimension N. Okay. This statement, this statement, together with what I've said about complex. Yeah. So that's our object, and that's our goal, is to try to build stratified spaces with the sheaves satisfying duality. Losing my erasers. Where do they go? On the table. Ah. Well, we know how to start. We start with the open top stratum. Well, so let's let U I be x minus x, n minus i minus 1. So these are open sets, the complements of the strata of a codimension i or 1, codimension more than i. Okay, so u naught, which is simply x minus x2, is a smooth manifold, it's a smooth oriented manifold. So I know what sheaf to use there. I use the one we're used to, ordinary Poincaré duality. Use the constant sheaf in degree n. The dualizing sheaf for u naught is simply the constant sheaf in degree minus n. And the isomorphism phi between these is the identity, well, to say it's the identity, I have to have this identification, and this identification depends on the orientation. You flip the orientation, you flip the fundamental uh, Borel-Moore chain. So this, this really records the orientation. Okay. So we have now a sheaf, a complex of sheaves, namely this one, and a duality isomorphism in degree n over the top stratum what we have for smooth or in the manifolds. We're going to work inductively. Over the UI, increasing I. So suppose we have CI complex of sheaves over UI and phi i from C i shifted by n into the Verdier dual of C i quasi isomorphism. And in fact, there's a symmetry condition uh, that I haven't had time to talk about, which says that this uh, equivalence is homotopic to its dual. Anyway, that's my inductive hypothesis. I want to try to extend over the next stratum, which is x uh, n minus i minus 1 minus x n minus i minus 2. So here's the lower stratum.
and here's the rest of the stratified space. And I have a sheaf, a complex of sheaves, CI out here. Well, there are two obvious extensions over this next stratum. You can extend by zero, that's called J lower shriek, simply extend this section, sections that are zero in a neighborhood and extend by zero. Or I could take the biggest extension and the difference between these two is something that I'll write this way. And I'll just say a word about this. So, this ex so what is this extension when I restrict to the lower stratum? It associates to any open set here the cohomology of a punctured neighborhood of that lower strata with, in, in, uh, with respect to the original complex. So because of my hypotheses about the strata that they're locally topologically trivial, this is a cohomologically locally constant sheaf along the stratum. So this is uh, locally constant cohomology. that cohomological sheaf, and the stalks are simply the hypercohomology of the length of the stalk with coefficients in the original complex that exists on the outside. So associated to a point, you take the length of the point, it sits out in the part of the space where the complex of sheaves is defined, you restrict that complex of sheaves to the length, you take its hypercohomology. But this satisfies duality because of the inductive hypothesis and the fact that Al has a nice product neighborhood in space. So these cohomology sheaves are simply these local systems of the cohomology of the link. Okay. Well, I, I want to kill off half of that cohomology as I've talked about before. So, so we need a construction due to Deline, called, sometimes called Deline cohomology. If you have a complex of sheaves and if you have a subsheaf in some cohomological degree i, in the cohomology sheaves, this is a subsheaf, then there's something called the truncation up to and including s of this complex. It's a new complex, it sits naturally inside C, and the cohomology of this complex agrees with the cohomology of C below dimension I, and in dimension I it's exactly S mapping in. So the cohomology here injects into the cohomology here, it picks up everything below the middle, uh, below I, and it picks up S in degree I. The completely straightforward construction, the amazing thing is it's well defined in the derived category. What you do is you simply take all the local sections of C that are of degree less than this one, or sections of C of this degree, provided they're closed and their cohomology, uh, their, uh, their image in the cohomology sheaf is in the subsheaf S. So, the most naive construction is where you take s equals zero and you simply truncate less than or equal to a dimension. Here we're allowed to do something in the top dimension, pick any subchief and cohomology. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do here. This is a duality, uh, satisfies Poincare duality in dimension equal to the dimension of the link. I need a self-annihilating Lagrangian subspace in there, and I need it to be invariant under monodromy. I need a local system. If I have all of that, then I can, then I can in fact make the extension, which is simply to do this: take this truncation less than or equal to this Lagrangian subspace in the middle of this locally constant sheaf, and then embed it back in to the ambient space. 
take the quotient, I mean, there's several ways to say this, but to take the quotient, take this map, take the kernel, that will be Xi plus one, and it will fit into an exact triangle like that. So this guy is, agrees with what we had away from the lower stratum. Across the lower stratum, we put in exactly half the cohomology. And it's a straightforward exercise to show that if you started with duality, if this is a Lagrangian subspace in the middle, either for torsion or intersection, depending on the parity, this will satisfy duality. There's a unique, unique duality here extending that. Okay, well, I've run out of time, so let me just say how the construction ends. I look at my closed objects will be closed, compact stratified spaces with sheaves, complexes of sheaves that over the top stratum agree with this one. And as you pass from one of these UI to the next one is equivalent to this extension process for some Lagrangian uh, subsheaf here, uh, sublocal system here. So those are my closed objects. They include all manifolds, manifolds with trivial stratification and the constant sheet Z, but they include much more. Those are the closed objects. You map them in, there's a notion of an object like that with a boundary or maybe a collar neighborhood of infinity. Those are the, those are the things that these closed objects might bound. You make a bordism theory out of those. The coefficients of a point are exactly what I wrote down before, except in dimension one, where there's no example of Durham variant one. Because if you have a closed object and its signature, say, is zero, then its middle cohomology has a Lagrangian subspace. And therefore, you can take the cone over it and make that an object in your theory. So anything of signatures, even object of signature zero, bounds. And similarly for the torsion case, the odd object. Now, one last remark. To make this into an extraordinary homology theory, you have to check the axioms. And the one axiom that requires a little thought is excision or Meyer Vitoris, where you have, a, have one of these objects mapping into, say, a union of two open sets, and you need to cut it into two along a co-dimension one boundary, one in one set, one in the other. You, I don't know how to do that for the stratified spaces I was talking about, because they're purely topological. So to get that property, I use the Whitney conditions, which allow you to do this co-dimension one uh, cutting. And so if you replace these more general stratified spaces with Whitney stratified spaces, everything that I've said goes through, and you actually get an extraordinary homology theory, which, when you make it periodic, is dual to real K theory at odd primes. And at two represents, cohomology, represents homology, and it's the dual theory to surgery theory, which was what I was really interested in. But one, I'm out of time, and two, that would be beyond the pale for this conference, so I won't tell you about surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Well, I have a question about, so you have some choices of Lagrangians. Yeah. So, what can be said about topology of the corresponding set of choices? Like in classical theory of symplectic geometry, we know something about topology of the Lagrangian Grassmann. Well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, <coughs> certainly you can make non-trivial elements by, say, starting with a closed thing, choosing two different Lagrangians yeah. to bound in two different ways and sticking them together and getting a non-trivial element yeah. one degree higher or maybe doing it again. Is there some sort of floor theory for all of this? Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just I, in spite of the fact that I sat here all week, that never occurred to me. In fact, in spite of the fact that I share a hallway with Kenji, that never occurred to me. Let me think about it. Any other questions? Let's take the speaker again.